Minister, it's uh, an immense honor to uh, have us here with us. Um, thank you so much for uh, accepting uh, this uh, invitation, changing your entire schedule uh, today. Um, we are so honored to have uh, to open a conversation, uh, and how to open a better conversation with a Nobel Prize winner. Let me introduce you to the audience, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Do you allow me to call you Shimon for this? <laughs> That's my name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the purpose of this conference. So let me introduce you to a thousand uh, bloggers, so opinion leaders and opinion tellers of the world. We have 37 countries in front of you. Um, the average age must be around 35, I don't know exactly. The latest look young. Yeah. <laughs> and they are coming from all around the world. Um, and <laughs> we are uh, people who like conversations and dialogue. We express our opinions. And we are very, very much uh, interested into uh, getting a better wall, a flat wall, getting closer to each other. And I'd like to stress that no other Middle Eastern leader has put so much effort uh, in promoting uh, uh, and, and personal investment in promoting peace in the Middle East. And we are here from 37 countries. This is uh, for us uh, a pleasure. And uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister, I would like to uh, uh, ask you if you, if you would uh, to uh, explain us what you think, how you think the world has changed with so much uh, experience with technology and with the internet, uh, how you see it evolving currently. Well, thank you very much. You know, I just uh, visited some universities in the States and here in France <coughs> and some other audiences. My impression is that the people are so depressed. You know, they think the world is a mess. They have the Iranians building a bomb. They have the fanatic religions trying to take over the Middle East. You have a new China, you have a different Russia. Wherever you move around, it's full of problems and troubles, and people really don't know what's happening, what is the future, how we're going to live in a world full with the nuclear bombs and missiles. May I say from the very beginning, in my judgment, the world is not an MS. The world is pregnant with a new age. And what we are really seeing is a transition. Like every transition, it's full of pains, of questions, of changing images, changing bodies, changing outlooks. But you know, the Stone Age is over. 
not because there are no more stones. It's over because there is no more age. Finished. And we can see the end of such an age. And you people of the internet are really trying to give birth to this sort of a new age. You are, if I can say so, the midwife of this process. In French, by the way, they have a more beautiful name. They call it La Femme Sage, the wise women that helps to deliver a new child for our time. And really the internet has revolutionized, I shall just say a few words why I think so. A, you liberated us from the need to invest a great effort in order to remember things. Why should we remember? The past is not so brilliant. It's full of troubles, of wars. Not only that, why should we waste our intellectual energies to remember when the internet or the computer can remember a new place? Buy a Google and stop remember. You can get all the information about the past. I think the task of a human being nowadays is not to remember, but to imagine, to create, to discover. Today we don't make a living from what we had or from what we remember, but from what we can discover. And we are just at the beginning of the new age. So let's change our efforts from uh, traditional memory to intellectual imagination. That will enrich our life. Then also I believe that the internet saves a lot, a lot of time. You don't go, have to go to the banks and you don't, don't have to go to the stores and you don't have to go to the airports. Really, it's time saving. And since our life is so short, why waste it on unnecessary efforts? It's a great thing. And uh, then again, the internet is free of prejudice, prejudices. It's open, it's free. And maybe the most important task of the internet is to bring in a young generation in the future. The internet really is the best teacher of our children. My impression is that the young people stopped reading papers, even stopped re watching television. They have an internet. And if they have five minutes, they can do it with the internet in five minutes. If they have five hours, they spend five hours. Occasionally for romantic purposes. <laughs> but otherwise, for a more serious one. And uh, you can create today's schools by internet. You can have the best professors uh, enabling to provide their lectures to an unlimited audience. Yesterday night I met with a, one of the leaders of Nigeria who comes from a very poor region. And he told me that in his poor region, all schools are already connected with internet. Africa, or this sort of education, modern education, would never arrive in Africa, wouldn't it be for the internet? And you know better than I do that this is just the beginning. Now when I say one age is over and another age is being born, let me say a word, what is the age which is disappearing? And what is the age that is arriving? The most important change is, is that states, countries, borders, governments are no longer too important. They were important when we were making our living from the land. 
the most important branch of the previous economy was cultivating the land, natural resources. That forced us to divide the globe into lands, to put in frontiers, to declare sovereignties, to defend the land, to extend the land, and for that purpose to build armies, to go to war, to spend a lot of money on arms. And actually the previous history was written with red ink, wars and wars and wars, again to defend the piece of land that you have or to enlarge it. The minute that science and technology took over the future of our life and became the source of our wealth, what do you need borders? You cannot put border, borders on science. It's nonsense. You cannot have armies conquering wisdom. You cannot. They look and they defend. And you cannot actually have governments controlling the economy. Because the minute the economy became an economy without borders, without land, without armies, you know, every day, a trillion and a half trillion dollars are changing hands. There is no government on the world that has the slightest influence about the flow of money. Where is the money going to land? Even the United States cannot give order to global money where to land. So governments have budgets, they don't have money. The money is in the hands of the global companies that have money but don't need budgets. But they don't have to go to make politics and to argue, even they don't have to be popular. Because governments with ministers, every minister to the best of my, my knowledge, would like to be very popular. <coughs> and if you want to be popular, you lose the freedom of action. You are so crazy to be popular that you forget why you became a politician. And then governments are good for war and poor for peace for the very same reason. They are good for war because if you are being attacked, the, nations, the nation is united, so is the government. But when it comes to peace, the politics is divided. Not because there are people for peace and people are against peace, but the division is not about the principle of peace, but about the cost of peace. So one political party will say give back 100%. Other will say 80%. The third will say 60%. And if you say 100%, you're not very popular. If you say 60%, you can get more votes. And uh, as a result, the politicians are negotiating peace with themselves. They don't pay attention to the enemy, they are so busy collecting the support. And they have not enough chances to convince their people to make the full move, the full step. It's very unpopular. Because somebody will come from another party and says, what the hell are you doing? Why are you making so many concessions? Well, you're selling your country down uh, to hell. So else they're not good on, on peace governments. Then there is a third point, which is a difference between the old age and the new age. In the old age, wealth was a matter of accumulation. What you have accumulated? Buildings, machines, gold, silver. Today we know that what you have accumulated doesn't stand the, taste, the test of time. It's all the time losing its value. It is not what you accumulated, but what you are <coughs> penetrating that gives you wealth. Today the strength of a country is not how many miles, square miles you have, but how many patents you produce. 
if you have a new idea, you can really do it. So governments are very conservative, and modern companies have the culture of risk-taking. It's interesting not only because the economy became global, but it has two other effects, which are again very fascinating. It doesn't give only strengths to globality, it gives also strengths to individual people. Today, a man can create an economic state of his own in a fair way. Take Bill Gates. He didn't rob, he didn't kill, he didn't cheat. <coughs> he was even not like a rock fellow or a fall. <coughs> he became rich because he had a good idea and maybe a good deal, a good initiative. <coughs> Take the two young boys that created Google. Their budget is larger than any budget of any government in the Middle East. Again, they didn't talk, they didn't shoot, they didn't try. They introduced something new. So individual people are becoming creators of economic companies. You call it private companies. And that's the third phenomenon, which is again very fascinating. There is no more private companies. Because the minute you become global, you become public. And you have world responsibilities. All of you, if you have business, you begin to be interested in the political situation in every country you work. You want to have better relations with the community. You care about stability and about peace. So public, private became public. And the main phenomena that we see is governments out, they don't have a real role, and what you can call it civil societies, or you can call it private business, private sector, is in. And the government lost also something which is a very most fascinating thing. Governments don't control any more demography. They cannot keep their countries homogeneous because the minute the country is becoming rich, the people are becoming lazy, they don't produce children, so they don't have workers. So they have to build, to bring in workers from different societies, from different cultures, take, take Europe. The idea of the United Europe was the beginning to have a Christian declaration, to keep Europe basically Christian. It was created by three great Christian leaders, the Gaspari of Italy, Adno of Germany, Schumann of Paris. And they thought, here we are going to keep a continent which is generally Christian and basically Catholic. They wouldn't like to hear about anybody else. For example, they wouldn't like to have Turkey in it. Because Turkey is not Christian, it's Muslim. But look what happened. <coughs> they closed all the windows and they opened all the doors. <laughs> all of a sudden, the Muslim world enters Europe, not because of a political decision, but because of an economic situation. The countries, the developed countries, have more old people because the expectancy of life goes up, and less young people to support them. They don't have enough children. So they bring in people who have less work, more workers, more children. And wherever you move around, you see to them not only money, not only armies are changing. Even armies stop to be of importance nationally. The armies we build were armies to fight other armies. The equipment, the structure of the army. Today armies have to fight terror. And it's an absurd 
to take a F-16, an American plane that cost hundred million dollars a piece, and to chase a single terrorist. <laughs> to finally can have a shoulder missile and bring down the plane. Or to send a tank, like it happened in our war too. To kill two terrorists that uh, stay in an ambush and they have an anti-tank weapon and they destroy the tank. So what is the value of armies? Unless you will build a force to fight terror with a new technology, by the way, maybe nanotechnology, to make the weapons smaller, miniature, to make the optics more sophisticated, that you can see through the walls or be behind the, the dress to see if you have a terrorist. And also, to introduce small robots in the out of war. As you have planes without pilots, theoretically at least, you can have armies without soldiers. Why is the life of a soldier? Send a small robot. Let them fire, let them shoot, let them go along and save the life. And it is a tremendous change and we are just at the beginning of it. New responsibilities. You know, look 10 or 12 years ago, 15 years ago, the world was divided at the beginning between East and West, communists and Democrats, later on between North and South, the North being rich, basically white, the South being poor, basically colored, and they thought this is a good divided world. In 15 or 20 years, is China poor? Are the Chinese white? Now the most fascinating thing in my eyes is what's happening with China itself. And here again the governments are making a mistake. They want to engage themselves in an ideological war. No chance to win. If the United States wants to convince the rest of the world to become Democrats, <coughs> the Muslims are, say, are saying, why should I become Democrat? Being a Muslim is more important. You don't stand the chance to win the ideological war. And what brought an end to communism in China is not an army, is not a diplomacy, but a modern economy that forces the Chinese to open the skies, to lower the borders, to introduce transparency and decency. And let me say a word about those two things. You cannot run modern economy without transparency and without decency. Why? In the old world, when you wanted to buy something, you could see with your own eyes the size of the building, the quality of the equipment. Today, when you buy a company, you don't pay for the buildings, you don't pay for the equipment, you pay for one thing, for the potential of the company to produce new ideas. And if you don't trust the information about the potential, you will not buy. Uh, Mr. Buffett from the United States bought just a few months ago his Israeli company. He paid for it four billion dollars. You look at the company, they don't have big buildings, they have a little bit of machinery. He didn't pay for it. He paid for the potential. The Israeli economy is now in a flourishing situation, not because we have more equipment, not because we have more buildings, but because we have young, able people who are using their potential. And you cannot measure economy by bookkeepers. You must measure economy by people with sharp eyes that can identify where is the potential, where is the wisdom, where can you do business. And I'm returning to China. You know, I, over the last uh, two or three weeks, I had some talks 
with members of the Politburo of China. I was fascinated. They told me that the new ideology of China today is harmony, to harmonize the relations between men and men, men in nature, because China has now a terrible ecological situation. China has free speech, it doesn't have free air. And you know, free air is more democratic than free speech. If you cannot breathe, what can you do with the free speech? And then they want also to harmonize the relations among nations. I was a member of a kibbutz and I heard those two gentlemen from Politburo. I felt like going back to the kibbutz, you know, so naive, so innocent, so beautiful, to harmonize life. And now I'm watching with great fascination to a new continent which will now take will begin it uh, take off, in my judgment, the African continent. In the African continent, there is a new competition between the philanthropy of modern business. I mean, Bill Gates has no foreign aid in American government. The foreign aid of the United States is $25 billion a year. Bill Gates and Buffett can spend $60 billion a year. And the American philanthropy is going to cure AIDS. Well, I'm thinking, can you really cure AIDS if you don't have clean water? Maybe in order to get rid of AIDS, you have to have to purify the water. And on the other hand, you have the Chinese harmony coming to Africa. They will not handle AIDS they will build infrastructure. And it will be a fascinated, fascinating competition between the American philanthropy and the Chinese harmony. By the way, the difference between my kibbutz and China, my kibbutz consists of hundred thousands, young and naive. China is a billion and a quarter, old and wise. So the Chinese harmony is something different from the harmony that I experience in my kibbutz. But they're going to harmonize Africa. And they say, we Chinese and you Africans, together we are a third of humanity. And why not? I, I'm really happy. <coughs> Time has come to correct all the mistakes that were done to Africa to enable them to breathe and proceed. So the new force is neither military, nor diplomatic, nor political, nor national. The new force is modern science, modern technology, and modern companies. I, I want to say a word about Israel too. I feel as Israeli that maybe we hand, hanged too much on strategy and too much on diplomacy and not enough on economy. I cannot see a political solution really to the Middle East, but I can see an economic preparation for a political solution by introducing modern economy. I mean, uh, in modern terms, you cannot put a border on ecology. You cannot force the water to stream in accordance with your state department. Water doesn't need visas. You cannot uh, really introduce IT if you want to have barriers. You cannot commerce unless you have free trade relations. And for the first time, I think we uh, agreed with the Palestinians and the Jordanians and the Israelis to convert the whole border between us, which is 400 kilometers long, and make it into an economic zone open to the three of us. This will also include building a canal 
from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is losing water. It got previously the water of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is not such a great river. It has more public relations than water. <laughs> but if you take away the water, the Dead Sea is dying. So you have to comp compensate. You cannot compensate unless you do it by all the three of us, jointly and together. And again, very interesting. If you would try to get the money for such a canal from governments, they don't have the money. But when you are trying to get the investment from private capital and global economy, yes, because they are looking for emerging markets, for emerging opportunities, for the future, for emerging technologies. And if I am optimistic, it is very much because of it. And I think uh, all of us, the Palestinians, the Jordanians, the Israelis, must understand that we cannot live under one flag or one opinion. Democracy in our time is not only the right of every person to be equal, but also the equal right of every person to be different. Democracy is the right to be different. Even the right to make mistakes. The obligation to correct them. So I see the new age arriving in Africa. I see the new age arriving in the Middle East. It may take a time. We are very impatient. I mean, I said the world is pregnant. I don't mean it will take nine months. <laughs> because there is a difference between an individual pregnancy and a historic pregnancy. It may take a little bit more, but I can see the newly arriving epoch. So I would like to conclude my remarks with a story that I heard from an African. Not only an African, he's a Muslim, he's a teacher, he's against Israel, who lives in South Africa. And from this unexpected person, source, he told me a Jewish story, which I liked very much. And the story is about a rabbi and his students that were discussing the very important issue, when is night over? When does the day begin? Some of the students say, well, if you can distinguish between a goat and a lamp, maybe the night is over. Another student says, well, if you can distinguish between a fig tree and an olive tree, maybe the day begins. The rabbi kept quiet and then they turned to the rabbi, asked the rabbi, what would be your distinction? He thought for a while and he says, if you meet a person, rich or poor, and they say, you are my brother. When you reach a woman, whether black or white, and you say, you are my sister, he says, the night is over, the day began. Thank you. Conversations and we, you know, uh, we've we've talked about it yesterday about your presence and how we are honored here. Then why? And I think we are not. I mean, I, I'd love uh, us as well. So, some of us, Thierry Crouzet, who is a French author, has written a book. He calls us. He calls you the fifth power of people. And you know, I'd like us to talk more about these issues and understand them better, the world, 
than technology. And I think we should recognize the conversation and uh, have uh, the opportunity of having you here and have uh, some questions. But just see, thank you so much for organizing <coughs> this. If you have time, still, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, Yossi, would you, so please think of questions, can we have mics, uh, a few questions, uh, can you line up uh, here if you want to ask questions? Maybe the and, people and who want to ask, can you stand on the, on the alley, one behind the other, so we can do it faster. And Yossi Vardy has uh, uh, introduced us in, uh, in, in Davos and uh, facilitated uh, this uh, event. Uh, thank you, Yossi. Will you have a first question and would you help me moderate yeah, the conversation? I, uh, I would like uh, Shimon to, to ask you two short questions. Number one, in your words, we heard the enthusiasm of a young person and the irony of somebody who is very experienced. Elizabeth Tyle Taylor, when she went into her seventh marriage, was asked, why are you doing it the seventh time? And she said, this is the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> <laughs> and the question I would like to ask you, are you more hopeful or are you more <coughs> disenchanted? I am totally hopeful. <laughs> I would describe myself as an optimist and a dissatisfied person. I am dissatisfied about the present. I am hopeful about the future. I don't think that all the terrorists, all the fanatics have a future because they cannot sustain. They cannot <coughs> live on the old stones, on the old age. It's not a clash among cultures, it's a clash among generations. And there is a generation in maybe basically among uh, Muslims, that are afraid that modernity will kill their way of life. Okay. It's nonsense. You can be modern and you can remain a believer. Turkey is Muslim and modern. <laughs> Jordan is becoming modern. They don't have to stop to be Muslims. So I believe that uh, while we shall face troubles and it will have a cost, and we shall have to deal with Iran and other complicated uh, stories, which we can, by the way. Finally, the winner will be a new future. And on a personal note, I can say, look, optimists and pessimists die the same way. They live differently. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. So let's be optimistic. One more Is there a question in the room? Let, let me ask one more question. Please, uh, Mr. Perez, the 1,000 people that you see here actually represent, David, how many bloggers you are now monitoring? 60 million. They represent 60 million people which have internet sites that they go probably every day or every hour and they express their views. These are the most important group of opinion makers, 60 million of them. If you have a chance to try to suggest to them what are the issues they should address, what would be your recommendation or preference or request? Instead of having 60 million, <coughs> instead of having 60 millions, have 6 billions. That's it. And now to the questions and the answers. Please, can you introduce yourself? Oh, Matthias, I didn't see you with a light. Matthias Lukens, let me introduce you. I can introduce myself. Please. Matthias Lukens, I'm Matthias Lukens from the media team of the World Economic Forum. Um, Shimon Peres, we've just heard uh, about the 60 million bloggers in the world. There is an army of bloggers in the world. What can the bloggers do to resolve the Israeli-Arab conflict? Uh, look, it's an interesting question. <laughs> In my judgment, I told it to my American friends, instead of going to other countries with ideologies, with governments, 
Psalmist, come with your private sector, build branches, begin with schools, while all governments are object to the introduction of other governments, they welcome you, each of you, to come and do it. And you can take the risk. You can really contribute seriously. Open private business in all other places. What changed China is private business or modern economy. It can change every country in the Middle East and you will be welcomed. And you don't have to do it in the name of the governments. Do it in the name of the future. Do it in the name of a different world. And believe me, you know, the United States is now fighting in Iraq. It costs them half a billion dollars a day. They have 150,000 soldiers. You know, if they would take a month, 30 billion dollars of war, and even subsidize private business. Go to Iraq and build a new economy. Go to Egypt. Go to Iran. The Iranians are poor, corrupted, divided. Iran grew over the last 30, 15 years from a people of 30 million to a people of 70 million. They didn't create 40 million jobs. There is a lot of hungry children, of poor children. And even the Ayatollahs cannot feed their children with enriched uranium for breakfast. <laughs> they need something more than that. The strength of this extreme religion, here I mean Marxist. Marx says that religion is the opium of the masses. Yes, you can sell opium, you cannot make a living on it. And all of you gentlemen believe me, and I believe that you are interested in peace like myself. And I don't believe that your only motivation is money. I'm sure all of you are graduates of universities. You are people of curiosity, of obligation. And probably you feel rightly so that you do serve your societies by introducing modern uh, science. Do it elsewhere. Look, not China was shaped, say India too. The two most populated countries. How? By governments, by armies, by ideologies, or by really bringing to them a new opportunity in future. Please do it company-wise, individual-wise. Okay. You will be received with open arms by all of them and help them escape the unnecessary suffering and starvation. What we have is not to change our basic values what we have to change is our basic attitudes. So keep the Ten Commandments. But the best combination on earth is Ten Commandments with one internet. <laughs> I think we have a question. Before we get back to the fifth power, I think we have a question, Mr. Prime Minister, from French TV here. Euh, bonjour, Monsieur Pérez. Je suis Nora Mesiani, iTélé Canal Plus. Je vais vous poser des questions en français. Le qui nous traduira. Il faut attendre si il faut que vous gardiez une certaine distance entre les microphones. D'accord. Merci. <rire> euh, je, je sais que vous parlez très bien français, donc c'est pour ça que je me permets de vous poser la question en français. Euh, petite, première petite question. Euh, vous. Oui, une question. Alors, vous, par, vous parliez d'espoir, de, vous, vous aviez beaucoup d'espoir en Internet, que pour vous c'était l'avenir, notamment l'avenir des jeunes, mais est-ce qu'Internet ne vous fait pas peur aussi, parce que c'est un vecteur aussi euh, de haine, euh, de, de discours euh, dangereux, donc est-ce que ça ne vous fait pas peur Et deuxième petite question, qui a presque rien à voir, mais... Euh, 
Que pensez-vous des déclarations du, du ministre israélien des infrastructures qui a recommandé à M. Olmert de ne pas parler de l'arme nucléaire israélienne Bien. Je ne pense pas que vous pouvez terminer les uns et les autres problèmes dans quelques minutes, aussi pas dans quelques années. Mais la première chose qu'il faut faire, c'est terminer les violences. Vous ne pouvez pas changer le caractère humain comme ça. Mais à mon avis, la guerre, la haine, la violence est totally pas nécessaire. Et plus qu'on peut gagner un nouvel espoir qui n'est pas nécessairement religieux et pas nécessairement aussi national, mais profondément scientifique et technologique, vous pouvez changer le monde. Je ne sais pas combien de temps nous sommes besoin. Pour un personne, euh, 10 ans, c'est une très longue période. Historiquement, 10 ans, ce n'est pas une très longue euh, période de temps. Et vous pouvez changer point après point, pays après pays. C'est le point. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. We'll switch back to English, I'm sorry, uh, for 37 countries here and get another question. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> and another question, can we get you a mic? Uh, <coughs> sir? It's good but to hear a little bit of French, I should say, in Paris. <laughs> can you please I introduce Because I prefer to speak French in London and English in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? Please? Yes, hello, uh, my name is Yann Blanchard. And um, yesterday we had a very interesting talk from a Swedish professor. And a question was asked to him, uh, what do you think about the $100 computer program, which is meant to spread knowledge, uh, especially in Africa and other continents? And he answered, what good is a computer if you don't have electricity? So my question is, What do you think of the energy crisis, and especially in the new world that is arriving or newly born? I think Nekopola. You are referring to Neko, ne, the idea of uh, Nekopola, right? Yes. He says you can do it on batteries. He does need electricity. So it is a problem. <laughs> and we are going to have new batteries. I think, it, I don't know how long it will take, we're going to have batteries made of nanotechnology that can last for 20, 30 years without any recharge. I think basically one of the ways to cut down terror is by cutting down the cost of oil. If you have oil, you refuse to become a Democrat. Better oil than democracy. You know, the Middle East is divided into two sorts of countries. The oily countries and the holy countries. <laughs> Israel, for example, is a holy country. We don't have oil, we don't have water. So we have to do something else, scientifically and technologically. But that is true all over the world. And I appreciate very much the internet that he has introduced. And uh, he says it will cost, if I'm not wrong, $100 a piece. <coughs> and it will work on batteries. So why not? Uh, look, Africa can become the greatest supplier of clean energy to Europe. Africa has two or three sources which are extremely important. Hydroelectrics, 
like for example the Victoria Falls, and they have solar energy. They have a lot of sun. Israel too, we are going to go over from oil to solar energy. I hope in 20 years, 80% of our energy will come from sun. And we feel it's better to hang on the sun than to hang on Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you know the sun is more permanent, even more democratic. <laughs> so it will take a little bit of time and we can do it. So we have a last question. Uh, please, in, oh, you were first, yes. Please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Esme Voss. I am the founder of MuniWireless.com, which is about citywide Wi-Fi projects around the world. My question is the following. You mentioned that Africa, many uh, communities are getting the internet in the schools. And what I'm seeing is that very often when they get the internet, they get also our ideas, our thoughts, our applications to them. But it would be interesting because the internet is a two-way street. How, what can we do to get their voices heard on our side, to get their applications, their thoughts? Here we are bloggers trying to get something down to them, and we, it would be nice to hear something from them. What are they doing? How do we enable that? Well, if I'm not wrong, there is a beginning of awakening in Africa too. I don't think that only the outside the world will save Africa. Africa has more and more educated people. The tragedy of Africa is violence and a little bit of corruption. Violence because the colonial age did a great deal of harm. The basic harm is that they have marked the borders, not in accordance with ethnic lines, but in accordance with colonial administration. So the borders divides <coughs> tribes and ethnicity, and the one of one way to another way. And that what creates so much troubles and wars Sudan, for example, Burundi, Algeria. <coughs> it's very hard for them to do it. It also reduces the wealth of the land, because here in Europe, land is a commodity. Their land is a memory. You cannot do much with it. But I speak with African leaders. I can say a country like, uh, for example, South Africa. And by the way, South Africa produced one of the greatest leaders of our time, Nelson Mandela. He was really an outstanding, outstanding tribe. What the black people in South Africa did is almost how to understand <coughs> the created courts of forgiveness. They brought to trial white people that killed them. And they forgave them. They didn't put them even under arrest. I asked the, the man who did it is to, to Desmond, the bishop. I asked one of my friends in Africa, I says, how did you do it? And he gave me a beautiful answer, a poetic. He says, each of us had a small Nelson Mandela in our heart. It's so hard to forgive and to pardon, my God. So I don't think it's anything will come outside of Africa. I think Africa itself begins to feel that their age is arriving. There was an age of Europe, there was an age of America, there is now an age of Asia. I believe now it's beginning the age of Africa. And I think it's a terrible mistake to ignore Africa, not to pay attention, to think that they are subhuman beings. It's nonsense. Africa can become a full member of a new society. And I'm so glad that American philanthropy and Chinese harmony and even European interests 
will help them. They won't replace them. And now China is talking also about, a Ch uh, Africa is talking about an African common market like Europe. No difference. And the Chinese invited 48 heads of states from Africa to the conference in Beijing and it was really a phenomenon. So don't look at the past, it's a waste of time. I know many professors of history don't like my remarks. They say that you have to study history so not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Well, even if you don't repeat the mistake of the past, it doesn't mean that you cannot produce new mistakes. And the modern mistake is no better than an old mistake. So, democracy is the right to make mistakes, but also the obligation to correct them. So if you shall have a democracy that will permit to make mistakes, but obliged to correct them, we shall have a better world. You have uh, changed us this morning. You have changed us because uh, you've changed us from convers a conversation about technology into the first conversation ever we had with a leader, a political leader, who has made so much for the world. And I'd like to commit in front of you and in front of you if you accept the challenge to try and make this not a conference but a movement. We have 37 countries here and I guess for peace we need dialogue and to have more and more of these uh, conversations with uh, political leaders. Thank and you. If you need a professional, I'm out of a job in Israel, so I can do it. <laughs>